So I'd like to um, now invite our panelists and our speakers to the, yes please, uh, to take a seat and we can have the Q&A and the panel discussion sort of together. Okay, so maybe um, it was a pleasure listening to Thomas and Florian uh, that have introduced them, I have introduced them and that have talked about their work. So maybe we can first start with a round of introductions from all of our panelists, uh, starting with Jean, please. So my name is Jean Barrett. Um, I did my master's and PhD in pure mathematics, and then I came to EPFL for my postdoc. Um, so after that, I was kind of craving something more concrete and a little less theoretical. I joined Roche about three years ago on a team that's much closer to the product side of the um, product life cycle rather than the POC and built up a sub team there. Uh, now we're at about 10 people. So my name is Mirko Bierbaume. I studied physics and specialized in theoretical physics at ETH. Then I switched to systems biology and did my PhD in systems biology where I was analyzing image-based uh, siRNA screens and set up as well an agent-based model to reproduce identified patterns. Then about 12 years ago I started as a lecturer at HSLU in Lucerne where I'm mainly teaching statistics, deep learning and vision, machine learning and besides my uh, teaching duties I'm also um, I'm involved in uh, several uh, research projects with various industry partners, among them Roche Diagnostics in Rotkreuz, and also with the Cantonal Hospital in Lucerne. Cool. Hi, I'm, oh, I'm Charlotte. I studied bioinformatics and tubing and joined Roche five years ago, where I'm currently working with real-world data, that is clinical data as well as genomics data and other modalities to um, support our late stage development organization and personalized healthcare efforts. Uh, my name is, oops, sorry. My name is Gabriel Krumnacher. I'm the head of data science at Zürke Engineering. My background is in um, computer science and machine learning research. And at Zürke, um, the data science team builds machine learning um, and software solutions around machine learning for, for our clients um, in Switzerland mainly. And we have a strong focus also on building medical machine learning applications because Silk has a long history of uh, building medical devices, also hardware devices and software devices. And we, we build upon that history um, to use these processes and knowledge um, to build compliant solutions using machine learning also that um, can then be um, go to the market in the US or, or in Europe. Hi, Marco Gianni Trapani. Uh, my background is in statistics. I did my master's and PhD in statistics. I then moved to a few industry and finally I've been now in pharma working with Roche for the past two and a half years. Um, I'm responsible for a team of global data and analytics for go to market, as we call it, which is looks, a looks after the post-clinical aspects of pharmaceutical company. So it's not as much scientific as many of the talk you've heard about, but very operational and very much focused on getting to our customers, to our patients, to our doctors in the most meaningful way. Thank you very much for the introductions. Maybe you can keep the mic, uh, Marco, and we, maybe we can sure. <laughs> do a reverse. Uh, so maybe as a kickoff uh, question, uh, we can ask uh, each of you about one application of AI that you find impactful uh, as it applies to AI in healthcare, either from your own field of work or from um, other work that has been shared before that you think this was really great. Um, maybe you, we can start with Marco. Sure, Alice. Um, so I may carry on on what I was sharing before. So bring an example on this area of application into the post-clinical aspects of things in pharmaceutical companies. And for everyone that works in a big pharma, I worked in a few of them, it's very much meaningful. We do carry a big responsibility of making sure that the resource that we invest is really 
used in the most impactful way for our patients. And sometimes when you think about a lot of the decisions in terms of investment decisions, there, is, there hasn't been a lot of real data analytics groundwork to drive those decisions. So a very impactful, what I consider a very impactful way was some work that we did um, on giving recommendations to our business leaders on where, how much, and when to invest in what part of the Roche portfolio, as an example. And that, I believe, again, is, is a very impactful one because it's, despite being extremely operational and maybe not fully direct to customers and so on, but it really helps in making sure that we maximize our resource for our patient outcomes and for our patient benefits. So that is what I would believe it's, um, I want to share just as a different one maybe compared to other speeches that have been spoken so far. Thanks, Marco. Florian? Yes, yeah, so, so one use case that, that I'm uh, a little bit involved in is um, deep learning based skin lesion classification. And I think that, that has the potential to really make a, a, a very big impact. And the idea is basically that, that you have a little demoscopic camera that you can attach to a phone and you take a picture of a skin lesion and, and the AI model will tell you whether it's a, um, malignant or benign, so whether it's just like a mole or whether it's cancer. And, and we've, we've known for quite a few years now that, that these systems can perform as well as dermatologists. And now we're really at the stage that we are able to bring it to the clinic because we, we've, we've then after that spent a lot of time dealing with stuff such as noisy labels and um, batch effects where you have like different cameras having different post-processing steps and, and making sure that we can um, generate models that really transfer and generalize to these, these different settings. And now I think we're in a stage where, we, where we're really very close to rolling them out and, and being able to sort of um, make these screenings affordable um, for a very, very wide range of patients. And so, so I think that's a really nice high impact application of AI. Thanks, Florian. Yeah, I agree. I, I think in general the field of uh, diagnostics has a lot of potential for impactful machine learning applications. Um, we're working at the moment with a client also on a, a diagnostics application. Here the case is that there's uh, different diseases, three different diseases that are hard to distinguish for non-specialist doctors. Um, and so a lot of like these diseases get then misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. And that's unfortunate, of course, because they could be treated and the patient could be helped if they would get the right diagnosis. And so here we've built machine learning models that can actually, um, as, as, as was the case before, uh, perform on par um, or better actually than uh, non-specialist doctors to identify these diseases. Um, and, and this is also, I mean, if you have access to specialists, then maybe that's not such a big impact, but there's a lot of regions in the world where access is very limited to specialists. And I think in these cases also, uh, models like this can, can really help um, um, the, the patients directly and, and increase the um, correct um, treatment that is given to these patients. Thanks very much. So this focus on patients, I keep hearing <laughs> over and over. Thomas? Uh, so I, I have maybe a, yeah, a different view because uh, we're, we're both very high level. I think at Huggyface where we mostly provide tools for people to build things rather than, than building them ourselves. But yeah, I, I see there is, there is like really amazing application coming in, in all these fields that I think, yeah, just like uh, NLP, just it, we, we start to have computer that can understand basically what, what is written. And <laughs> just the amount of impactful application that you can have out of this is, is really amazing. So yeah. I would have hard time to pinpoint one specific thing, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I also think we, we heard so many good examples over the last two days already that it's hard to identify one, <laughs> one specific one. But um, to me also, I would think that the most impactful ones are that the ones that really make a, a difference to how patients are being treated and that can affect diagnosis as well as treatment decisions, understanding patient similarities and, and things like that. But actually also things like translation, right? So um, especially if we see crises where people have to migrate and, and leave their countries, having an opportunity to interact and, and converse with their doctors by having someone translate or help with the translation is actually affecting the way the treatment is done. Um, in as much an impactful way, I would think, as identifying primary sites of tumor and other applications that we, that we often think about in pharma. So yeah, lots of, of good and impactful applications. Yeah, social determinants of health and how, it's, how we can impact socially as well is a critical aspect for sure. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Mirko? 
So from my perspective, um, I would like to give a rather um, also high level view um, directly out of the project we had together with Rush Diagnostics, which is um, the, the situation was we have uh, an instrument, a medical device, which is measuring blood gases and uh, um, electrolytes. And uh, well, it's very important that um, the measurements are precise. And uh, so the, the overall of uh, the project was to predict in um, or to anticipate when measurements probably are deviating from the reference measurements. And uh, well, we started with uh, some very fancy anomaly detection methods. And in our case, uh, there was quite some resistance. Um, in the beginning from physicists, engineers at Roche, uh, they were saying, why are you applying um, those black uh, box models? And finally, we uh, we managed to integrate the neuron sequence, which is governing uh, those sensor measurements. And I think this is just an example um, how well, yeah, to approach um, this kind of models if you uh, manage to integrate domain um, knowledge in your models. Um, in some cases, you really manage to increase the performance of your predictions and as well, uh, and what is most important, interpretability. And I would say that's uh, what is, in general, uh, kind of a successful approach. Um, so because I work at Roche Diagnostics, it would be somewhat ridiculous to not be a representative to say uh, how we fought the pandemic. Um, and so back in February 2020, I had the privilege of being on the same scrum team as uh, Patrick Sagar, shout out to Pat, who uh, actually wrote the production level code uh, to go on the instruments for the first uh, SARS-CoV-2 test um, that turned into an IVD product um, in March 2020. And so um, now we're at over 200 million was the, <laughs> the number, but I see um, uh, I see that that's correct. That was the update that I had to check today. Um, probably you're wondering why am I answering a question about AI with an answer about uh, something that should be more software. Um, and really what we're talking about is 200 million tests, a huge, amazing data set, and then since then we've already started to turn that into a number of different products. So if you think about a large tech company that's maybe making those really nice benchmark data sets, um, if you switch over to pharmacy, you're actually getting data sets where, uh, you know, it's, it's the only place you can get those really nice large data sets where you're actually helping people on the healthcare side. That's really great. Thanks very much, everybody, for sharing. So, so now we have a sort of a baseline for where... Uh, everybody comes from. Maybe we can uh, continue with Jean, because you did mention about data. And uh, over the past two days or one and a half days, we heard about multimodal, multimodal data analysis, etc. Multi multimodal data analysis is really great, but you do need access to data first and foremost. And Jean, I wonder um, if you can share a little bit about how important, I mean, I think the question, the answer is very, but how important is data access <laughs> for any of these analysis? And then how can we build uh, the right data infrastructures or these processes to allow perhaps easier data access um, from your point of view and also from a pharmaceutical company, but also in anybody working in healthcare and life sciences point of view? Yeah, um, <coughs> I'm actually gonna use a terrible buzzword. Um, that Andrew Yang has been throwing around a lot, which is kind of data-centric AI. And I would say it's specifically applicable to uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Because if you think about um, the process that it takes to label nice data to do these large-scale projects, um, that's, that's what we really need to be focused on. We can't take someone who has a PhD in chemistry or biology and then say, we didn't put any thought into what, which, pieces we're asking you to label, right? And I would say data-centric AI is really uh, focusing on how you can turn a project into something that can scale in terms of the data set. Um, and then you're also taking into account the cost for building up that data set. 
And if you think about a uh, simple example like active learning or um, optimal experimental design, there you're usually starting with some pipeline where you have a substandard model of some sort, and then you're ranking all of the unlabeled data based on uncertainty. Then you go ahead and uh, label the data that you found most uncertain, and then you're kind of doing that process over and over again. But when you turn that into how much money you save on the business side, it's actually quite drastic, right? So really simple, thoughtful processes along the way can turn into, um, you know, it can change your POC uh, project into an actual product. Thanks very much. Maybe I can ask Gabriel. Uh, the same question because he was um, we were talking about last night how this end-to-end uh, -end viewpoint is actually useful for uh, the machine learning engineer and the data scientist and the delivery of those models etc so maybe you can share a few po uh, viewpoints from your uh, expertise uh, Gabriel yeah thanks uh, I, I mean I completely agree with she um, it's I think I mean the other aspect is is not just increasing the access to data, um, but also making the most use of the data that, that we have. Um, so I often, um, I come across this, this view that um, anyway we have to do a clinical trial or we have to use external data for validation as well. Um, so let's just, I mean, it's not that drastic, but, but somehow to maybe um, make it a bit extreme, do, do whatever we, we, we can with the data we have, but anyway we'll, we'll, we'll have this um, external data to um, to validate, um, and I think that's a very dangerous view because it's much better to um, already with development data or training data, the more careful we are with this data, the much better um, insights um, we get from that data, and it's not just that, I mean, maybe that we, we catch some mistake in a clinical trial, but that's re also really expensive, um, and usually there's much more data uh, for training these models, so we can actually get statistically better um, insights. It's just that the data might not be um, from exactly the same population as the in intended use. Um, so all effort that goes into um, exploration and analysis of this data, what subgroups does it have? Um, I mean, there's all these famous examples now also with COVID um, where, you know, the, uh, the diseased uh, group was all uh, x-rayed uh, lying down, obviously, and then the healthy patient standing up. And, and all these kind of factors, if you catch them early, um, you, you get so much better um, knowledge about the performance of your model early without um, having immediately that to then go to external data sets or, or clinical validation and, and can actually save money and also um, catch um, models that might not work as well as, as, as you thought. So I think, yes, of course, I mean, the data is super important also from a risk management perspective um, and really understanding that data um, and to be able to, to then have confidence and trust in in, in the output of, of the tests that are performed on that data. Thanks, Gabriel. Maybe finally I can ask Marco about this question because we've been talking about data models and data infrastructure quite a bit with Marco. Uh, so at maybe even an enterprise level, how to make sure that this um, data access is uh, facilitated, accelerated for the data, both the producers and the consumers? Maybe you can men mention a few words about that. Yeah, I, I would say I think we learn a lot today on, on some of these topics, right, about the fact that maybe because I'm old, but if you think about today, the amount of technology that we get for data integration, data storage, data computation, it's mind-blowing compared to a few years ago. Again, if I back to my PhD days, I, I, I would have loved to have all the technologies we have today. So I really think that technology nowadays is really helping a lot from a data access, where I would like to shift the focus maybe is on that sometimes we always think about data access on its own for data democratization, like to get access. Having said that, data access is not allowing data democratization per se. Data access alone it will bring data anarchy. You need data access as well as data governance in order to get data democratization. And sometimes, again, I've seen a lot of occasion where the focus is just on data access, and again, then a data anarchy situation unfortunately appears. And I would really invite everyone to think about the two jointly, because only when you establish and you think about your data as a valuable or maybe the most valuable asset that we have, only then then you need to establish about how do you're going to govern that, right? So I would invite everyone to think in two dimensions, because otherwise you may risk to, to a situation which is not allowing to produce a, a maximum value out of your data. 
Thanks very much. So, um, we talked about some of the, um, let's say, the advantages or the impact that uh, having access to data, having better models, having better, um, uh, you know, products um, bring. Now I want to shift a little bit also to uh, something that was also discussed yesterday about business value. So understanding the business, and this was mentioned several times during yesterday's talks as well, understanding the business is very important, or understanding your customer. And this customer can be uh, the patient or the healthcare professional or somebody from the company, right? So this is, these are all, um, let's say, customers, so to speak. And understanding the business value was also mentioned even in Regina Barsley's talk, asking the right question, right? So this was, she repeated over and over how asking the right scientific question was so valuable for um, answering the right question and also uh, finding the right answer. So maybe, um, I don't know who would like to take uh, the stage for this question. H what does it mean to understand business? And on the flip side, how can we, as data scientists or uh, applied uh, machine learning people, how can we make sure that these products that we build are adopted by business? So it's a two-way conversation that we need to have, right? It's not just um, what do you need, tell me what you need and I will deliver it to you. It's a two-way conversation. So would anybody like to take up uh, this question? Open to anybody. I can continue. Please. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I, I love this question from the point of view of making sure that we don't consider data science, machine learning, AI as a back office type of solutions, right? But it's really have to be a seat at the decision table, whatever the decision is. Could be clinical, could be non-clinical, could be any aspects of things. And I know that we have the duty as data scientists, as experts, to earn that seat at the table, right? They're not gonna give us for free. But uh, for sure, as soon as we're gonna make the journey and as soon as we can prove that we actually can make a difference sitting at decision tables, again, in whatever dimension, whatever uh, domain we're talking here, then I, I can say personal experience is that it is going to be a spiral success of, of events because that's when, as you said, you're not going to be just called to answer a question, but you are asked to give suggestion and recommendation. And that's where I'm personally always thinking about the career progression also with data scientists, if you think about that. One thing is to be an analyst, a different thing is to be what I'm calling a partner. A partner is someone that doesn't need to answer a question, needs to ask the question. A partner is someone that needs to come with the question, with the challenges, and proposing, of course, innovative solution to answer that question. Thanks, Marco. Thomas? Can maybe add just a, a few words, because we had that in, in many, many fields, ma many projects, uh, both at Hugging Face and, and, for instance, also in Big Science, where we were. So, so the example of Big Science, for instance, in this project where people uh, like from ethical background, sociological background, ML background, data science background, and all these people speak different languages, they all think their, their field is the most important, they all think that they know the truth, right? And the other are like, uh, need to, 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 to understand what they do. Uh, and I think what what was interesting was to to have a to to have this this kind of conflict also at some point uh, between people and to have this discussion uh, where people learn that they actually need to listen and to understand because if the other are proposing something there is usually also a good reason on the other side. It led to really uh, tricky uh, tricky discussion. At some point we also had to 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 take decision from the top, I would say, or somebody has to step up and say, hey, actually, we need, we need to really take a decision here. Uh, but the, but the, good, uh, the good mindset is, for, is to have every, everyone on the board that's, that's ready to listen. Uh, and we also do that at Hugging Face more precisely. So for instance, I was showing the model cards here, which have kind of the way we think it's important to talk about models. And what I think has been very interesting uh, about uh, that um, Nazanin, which, is, which has just done actually today Hugging Face, which is a, a researcher in model evaluation. Um, she has been asking many people uh, to read this model card and, and to try to understand how they read it 
do they actually read what you write and what they, what they pay attention to? Do they, which part? Do they read the limitation? Do they actually try to understand where the model comes from? And, and when, you, when you read what they, how they see your work, you understand that you're, you have really no idea how, how people read your work. And it, yeah. So I think this kind of self-awareness of um, both that your field is not the most important. If you're that scientist, you don't know all the truth everywhere. And both trying to, to understand how the people are actually reading and what they pay attention to in, 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 your, in your, the way you communicate and how you present your model. That leads to very interesting uh, development, I think, yeah. So for instance, this, this, this experiments of seeing how m people are reading model cars and how we talk about models, that will lead us to kind of improve a lot how we communicate about the, the model we developed, how we try to make our message go through better. That's actually quite an interesting viewpoint because, uh, so, um, I think this also allows collaboration between data science teams even, right? So, not just translation between, let's say, a data scientist uh, world and a business world, but between teams, so leading to more collaborative work. Charlotte, please. Yeah, maybe, maybe just one element to add to that. I, I think there is a huge cultural element to, um, to that, right? Like, staying curious, being open, being aware that not everyone knows everything, so being open for feedback and speaking with the colleagues internally, externally, staying, like coming to conferences. And that actually goes above the, the points we're speaking about, really also to the data access part, right? Really being willing to share your data, being willing to share your model, get feedback, iterate, and not just think, okay, I've done that, I've done it for two years now, I, I think this is good and I want to do anything else. And the data is mine because <laughs> I spend time collecting it and, and no one else should get it. So really that, that part of building a community, we see it a lot in the, in the open source space, but I think it's something that actually also within companies we could do much better. And I mean, Gunter mentioned for Roche, we have the, the advanced analytics network as one attempt to do that, but really of building that community sense that we are all in this together and, and only by working together internally and externally, we can, we can really achieve those ambitious goals. So, um, I think the element there is really working together and, and staying curious to hear other perspectives and, and going into the subject matter, um, even if you are just the data scientist trying to, to develop the model. Thanks, Charlotte. Anybody else wants to answer this question? Mirko? Yeah. Just a very short comment. I think uh, it was mentioned that uh, communication is very important, and I think uh, that happens uh, mostly through data visualization. Um, and I think that's really something which is very challenging. We have uh, two data visualization experts in our team, and I think it's, um, it, it opens up a discussion if you nicely uh, visualize your models, and, but still then it requires some knowledge of um, even uh, trained engineers, they need also some training, I guess, in machine learning. Otherwise, it's always a, tr a risk to draw some wrong conclusions from uh, from uh, modeling results. And I think that's a challenge, um, but um, I think data visualization is something which uh, cannot be overestimated. Thanks, Mirko. Um, so I know that there are um, some PhD students or postdocs in the audience, I think. Uh, so maybe one uh, question to, maybe, maybe you can continue, Mirko. Uh, for those uh, that do want to do more applied kind of uh, research, what are some key elements that they need to be aware of? In so some some of the uh, topics uh, Thomas already also mentioned. So it's not enough to just ask for state of the art, right? So you need to go beyond that for industrialization. Uh, but what skill sets uh, do you propose that these students or postdocs or early career researchers acquire for applied research or applied, let's say, uh, AI? Thanks. Well, that's a very good question. Um, I think there are plenty of courses, online courses, um, but um, I think the first and probably most essential step is always uh, the data engineering part. So that's probably also the most uh, challenging one to really get your data in uh, usable and uh, coherent format. And I think it was also mentioned this morning that this is really crucial um, to get uh, the tools to get this in an efficient way. And uh, I think that's always the first part. And um, it's uh, 
usually known that it's taking up up to 80% of a data science project. And well, then afterwards, I think it's uh, the field is growing, and at the end, you also have to rely, rely on experts, um, which are going to probably support you. And uh, but then I think it's um, it's still a uh, very grateful field. You can easily start with um, some models. Something is happening, and and it's uh, something which is um, kind of a, yeah grateful. Um, field where you can get quite far, then at the end uh, it's getting again a little bit more difficult and challenging. Thanks, Mirko. Maybe can I ask Florian, because I know that uh, you moved from uh, academia to industry, now back in academia, now because of that industrial experience and now you're teaching these students, so maybe you can bring some perspectives. Um, yeah, so, so I think B both in, uh, in, the, in my experience in, in industry, so I worked uh, for Siemens Research for four or five years before um, returning to, to academia and now uh, teaching um, and researching at Goethe University in Frankfurt. Um, I think it's, it's really important that, that you're open to work with people from different backgrounds and, and this is like what, what we talked about before because if you do want to, to, to get your models in the application and if you talk about applied research, you can't do it, you know, you can't live in your computer science or data science world and and sometimes it is a bit challenging to, to motivate sort of computer science students to, to develop a genuine interest in, in terms of talking to biologists or clinicians and 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 you know get get involved and 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 and, and to sort of take it serious in, in some way almost and um, so yeah so so this this I think is, is something you, you that that has to come from from oneself and and if you don't bring bring that with you then you know th there's plenty of really exciting work that you can do within computer science but but then maybe that's not so much the applied research side and I think doing applied research really is all about like this this collaborative work with people from very very different backgrounds and and um, and fields. Yeah. So this keyword collaboration, we keep hearing over and over, and curiosity and uh, being able to communicate with others. So maybe I'll take some questions from uh, Huva. Uh, thanks for sharing your insights. My question is that how we're thinking of improving the adoption of these advanced technologies for the end users, physicians and patients, especially for the non-digital native, non-digital native users, perhaps in post-clinical trial setup, in commercial, how do you see this? trend going? Who would like to take up this question? Maybe Jean, would you like to take this up? <laughs> so the adoption for non-digital native end users. Um, I'm kind of going to parrot a bunch of things that Florian and Marco have said. So Marco brought up this idea of a partner that's asking the questions. And then Florian uh, brought up the idea of actually coming to the table and sitting and listening with everybody. And I would say that uh, at that stage, when you're listening to everyone, um, it's not about reading the latest paper. Uh, you know, it's more about understanding the needs of those future users. Because in the end, a lot of what you're doing might be automating what they see as their day-to-day -day work. Right? So if you've already built up a relationship uh, with a large group of those users and they're the ones that came up with the idea for the project, they said, hey, this takes really way too long on my side. Um, and then you know, that process of coming up with a project is something that you're doing alongside those users. In my case, it's much more about uh, people developing assays and things like that and not so much on the physician side or post-IBD product. But I can imagine you'd want to start uh, there, right? Building up relationships when you're creating that project to begin with. And, and maybe to build on that, um, just building up that trust, right? Maybe figuring out who should be, where should you put your first effort? And, and maybe that is not necessary where you want to go in the long run, but really figuring out maybe who would be eager adopters. And if you think, I think there is one example that people see around um, apps that help you manage your, your oncology, your cancer diagnosis and your treatment. And although we know that maybe uh, the majority of those patients are actually uh, non-digital natives, uh, the ones who are crying for that, who want that because their phones are such an integral part, 
are uh, the younger generation, right? So maybe that's something where you can co-create and build trust um, that this is actually working and then once you reach the level of maturity, you can grow beyond that, right? And, and then you have something to build on and you have something to show. The other element there on the trust is also the decision on what models to choose and um, how transparently you, c you, you communicate the reasoning, right? So we, we heard a bit about explainable or interpretable AI, and I think that's a, going to be a huge field there in really explaining why the recommendation is made that is made. And you see it in apps, uh, in, 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 in um, uh, like GPS, right? Like in the, in, the, in the navigation apps, you can actually see the route so you can still interfere, right? And you can say, I'm not going to take this route, I'm going to take a different one because I don't trust this one's going to be good. And something like that could probably help in healthcare too. Mm -hmm. I actually read a blog post about how Uber drivers have this really amazing app that is so easy to use and you know so straightforward. And of course, the Uber users or you know the ones that are taking the uh, whereas for the doctors, the HR systems are so complicated to use. That, uh, and they're not interoperable. Oh, yeah. And so um, there, there's so much progress that can be made just by making things simpler uh, and the, for the early adopters, for sure. So for example, I was also um, uh, thinking about these rare disease communities uh, that are willing to share their data because they're, they are underserved, right? So they are the ones that can be sometimes the early adopters of some of these solutions. Thomas, did you yeah, want to? Yeah, no, just to, to maybe just double down on, on what Charles said, that the notion of trust is, I think, the key, the key notion anytime we want to use this model in real life, and that's the most easy, difficult to, to set up. And that involves, like, being, be, no, for these people, and even for us, I think, understanding where our models work, where they don't work. When, when you use the GPS, right, we all know that sometimes you don't trust it. You're like, oh, no, I, don't th I think you, you don't know. There is some work on the road. But because you know the limits of the, this new technology, you know where it doesn't work, you will say, no, I'll, I'll follow the, the street sign here because I, I think you're leading me in this very short, uh, mm -hmm. small route, which is typical GPS route, and then I'll be lost somewhere. Uh, but we need to establish this for all your all our machine learning on, on complex things. So find a way that people can understand where they work, where they don't work, so that they can trust them. And like in NLP, we have exactly the same problem for large language model. That's why we're doing big science. We don't really understand yet where they work, where they don't work. And that's where you can, that's the first step to establish this notion. Yeah, at some point. <laughs> yeah, the limitations of the methodologies, right? So great, this brings me to my uh, last question. Uh, I think we slowly need to wrap up. So we talked about all of these opportunities and nice things. Uh, what about challenges? So anybody that went out to dinner or coffee, you know that this is a question that I ask, what is your grand challenge? <laughs> um, what is the grand challenge or a challenge in AI and healthcare that we need to address uh, apart from all of the uh, topics that we already discussed maybe? Any other additional um, topics that you would like to bring? Marco, would you like to? Yeah. I'm not going to bring something new. I think it was mentioned, but I think is um, healthcare for me is maybe the, the industry where this um, the polarity of data that we have in terms of between confidentiality of data and shareability of data, right? That's where it's one of the sectors, if you allow me to say, across any of the others, where these polarities exist at, at this extreme, right? You do have, it's potentially the most regulated sectors for all good reasons. We need to protect our patient data, we need to protect our doctor's data and so on. We have to do that, it's our responsibility. At the same time, I think all of us in this room was passionate about data in healthcare, can imagine just the potential of sharing more of our data, right? We just heard about this, right? We do have so much, it, it exists, it's there. The opportunity to share it, it would be mind blowing, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can find the right balance between the two, I think that would be um, really the solution to a lot of the unmet needs that we have today for our patient, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I don't have the solution. I'm, I'm sorry for that, <laughs> but I, I, think, I think it's a challenge that um, if we can address in healthcare, it will be giving a lot of input, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there were some talks around, for example, privacy preserving or federated learning architectures, right? So also yesterday, I think this is key. And also the cost of not sharing, sort of the societal cost of not sharing that data is immense also. Okay, uh, Florian, would you like to say something? No, okay, sorry. Any, anybody else that wants to share their grand challenge? I wish, you know, these user stories. <laughs> uh, if I was a kind of thing, anybody else wants to share any comments about this topic? Please. Um. I, I think for me it's also, again, the cultural element, right? And that, that I mean, we had it this morning about what are the incentives of going fair and having actually to lay them out for every person in the journey rather than having that upfront willingness to do that because you can see the long-term goal. So really, I think for many people, seeing that big picture of where this is going and um, not having to like double down on the details of like, why should I be doing this right now? And like, why should I put in a little effort now um, to have this big goal because I can't see the really, I cannot, can't understand the goal in like five years time. So I think all of that of like really getting people to be more willing to do that and as a general part of their, their routine, um, uh, I think is one of the big challenges that, that I see. Thank you. Uh, just very short. Um, so I think access and um, to data, that, that's uh, one component, but still what is um, as important is just to have um, some very, um, set up very good data pipelines to bring all the data into a format which uh, makes makes it usable and uh, coherent, because um, otherwise it's, it's also a matter of money um, and time to bring all the data and uh, make it usable for data science and machine learning. And I think that's a general observation that the need for data engineers is much larger and we are probably not forming as many data engineers as uh, there is need for. And if you look at the curriculum in data science, the emphasis is usually on data analytics and I think there is uh, a large need for data engineers. And well, the second challenge is um, which was um, already said, is um, interpretability, uh, which is actually the basis for trust. And I think that's uh, something you, you always have to um, somehow force yourself to, to prepare data and model results in a way and to present it in a way that uh, makes it understandable and comprehensible. But still, there I would also say um, everyone needs probably in future a better training and fundamental knowledge in machine learning. And it should be also um, thought about including uh, machine learning in a much more um, consistent way in all curricula. And if we think about medical doctors who are trained in machine learning, the potential which uh, would r rise with um, such a knowledge about all the potential uh, that there is around I think that would be great. Thanks very much, Mirko. So I think we set the stage for our next session very well, which is going to be um, in, uh, at, in one hour, which is called Introduction to Trustworthy AI in Healthcare, Ethical and Regulatory Aspects. I think most of the topics that we discussed today were also related to that topic. Uh, not a coincidence. Uh, but not by design either. These are some of the challenges and we'll hear more about these topics in the afternoon. So uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and speakers for this really nice discussion and uh, to our speakers for their great talks, uh, of course. So I'd like to please uh, ask you to join me in thanking them. <laughs>